Vielas Estrellas tries hard to be your typical Chilean town. There's a school, a post office, and rows of insulated cabins, in which around 20 families live. The year-round snow and 20 hours of daylight are among the first signs it is far from average. 62 degrees south within the Antarctic Circle, it's far from anywhere. Every single person bears scars from an operation, men, women and children. That might sound horrifying, but this is no Philip Pullman-like nightmare. It's a practical consideration. Everyone has had their appendix removed. The nearest major hospital is around a thousand kilometers north across the Drake Passage. Astraeus is no place to get appendicitis. It might be the only town on earth you have to agree to elective surgery before moving in. Everyone here is employed by the Chilean Navy or research programs, or in the day-to-day -day running of Antarctica's Chilean village. This includes teachers of the Escuela Basica Primary School. Sometimes referred to as Los Pinguinitos, Little Penguins, the kids of Antarctica live a charmed life. Every day is a snow day. Perhaps the only thing more surprising than learning there is a school in Antarctica is to discover it's not the only one. Around 130 kilometers away is Argentine Escuela Provencal numero 38, serving Esperanza Base. South of 60, these are Antarctica's only permanent settlements. Both date back to a unique period when having babies in Antarctica became a competitive sport. This is the story of Antarctica's baby boom. Antarctica is the last place on Earth to be reached by humans. So how is it so difficult to say who got there first? And why does everyone want a slice of what seems to be the world's most inhospitable continent? My name is Thomas Bywater. In March 2020, while stranded on a ship in the Drake Passage, I had the opportunity to meet some of the adventurous characters drawn to Antarctica and learn some of its surprising episodes. Stories of archaeological hoaxes, murders in a continent without police, and a research station baby boom. In the span of just 200 years, the seven countries with claims and permanent footholds at the bottom of the world have developed rich, sometimes contradictory histories, New Zealand amongst them. This podcast aims to explore some of these episodes and see if Antarctica's short history could go back further than first thought. This is Detour Antarctica. Antarctica New Zealand's archives are full of curious artefacts. Dog biscuits, the fed Scots huskies, Shackleton Scotch and mummified penguins. There are over 50,000 photos and news clippings. However, there's one that stands out in particular. Dated Esperanza Base, 23rd of January, 1978. It's a nativity scene that was sent around the world. In blue, Mother Sylvia looks adoringly at newborn baby Emilio. Captain Jorge Palma, wearing an orange snow coat, looks like he's just come in from the cold, with a baby plucked from the ice. Gifts and congratulations surround them, sent by Argentine President Jorge Videla. The child is the first human being ever born in Antarctica, reads the caption. But the circumstances surrounding Emilio's birth were as strange as the place in which it happened. This was no accident. Babies aren't just born in Antarctica. In fact, being pregnant is banned. But why did it happen? And where is he now? Well, the Argentine phone book is full of E. Palmas. The clipping had no byline and was almost 44 years old. But there was one name attached to the story in a role that placed them inside the room. We had the name of photographer Horacio Villalobos. I'm sort of trying to get in touch with you as you're the only name I can find attached to a story that I am trying to research. Yeah, because I was the only one there. Yes. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, the only name attached to that story is because, I mean, I, you know, I, I really failed to see, I mean, any complication. It was a long, long uh, gone uh, story. It was a, a, that event that uh, occurred during Videla's uh, dictatorship. And this couple was sent there because the dictator decided that they wanted to have the first uh, Antarctic baby probably to compete with the Chileans. I don't know. And it was a joint thing with AP and probably Noticias Argentinas or whatever. I, I, it had been my project. I got everything there. And I, I, was, I was there and I photographed the, the baby. I'm kind of surprised that so 
you know, many years later, it, it wakes up the interest for anybody because actually the whole thing was kind of a, it was a silly event. It had been a race between Chile and Argentina to produce Antarctica's first baby. If it was meant to impress, it hadn't worked on Horatio. It was a different time, arranged by the army which had recently deposed Evita Perón in a coup d'etat. Now they were holding photo calls for newborns and young families in Antarctica. It was almost farcical, apart from the fact it was being stage managed by murderers. Horatio described an uncomfortable flight with some of the soldiers who had so recently disappeared their fellow countrymen. For me, it was kind of a nothing. It was a rather bothersome plane, you know, flight in a C-130, which is noisy and uncomfortable. I had to put up with a son of a bitch who at that time was general and he was the leading the, the mission to visit the baby. He was a general counsel, a, a well-known torturer and murderer with whom I had an argument. I stay there, which is nothing to be, to be commented upon. Belongs to a, to a period in Argentinian life which is a total disgrace. Argentina was a military dictatorship as was neighbouring Chile. They knew how to put on a show for the cameras, but only what they wanted to show. While babies were being born in Antarctica, between 10 and 30,000 people were disappeared on death flights. It seemed perverse that the same people who were flying Horatio out to see a child were involved in dropping dissidents into the Beagle Passage and the Rio de la Plata. As you say, it's a bit of a nothing and it was a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a... publicity stunt slash propaganda, I guess, for that, that era. Yeah but, yeah, yeah, but you see, but it was, in any case, it was an act of propaganda that did not carry any significant consequence because what, were, uh, what was the situation in those days? Let's say, so let's suppose that Videla and Pinochet wanted to compete. So there you have two dictators who were despised by most of the world competing in what? In you know, in <laughs> giving birth of a child in what they claim is their, is their part of the Antarctica. What was going on in Esperanza seemed like a sideshow to everything else that was going on in the era. But Argentina continued with its strange mission. Emilio was not the last baby to be born in Antarctica. According to the Argentine Ministry of Defence, there would be seven more babies born there between 1978 and 85. The base adopted a motto, permanence is an act of sacrifice, permanencia un acto de sacrificio. Those volunteering to bring their family to the ice were giving up the comforts of a normal life and whatever chance of a normal life thereafter. Back in Via Estrellas, the Chileans must have felt as if they were missing out on the action. In 1983, they got busy with their own Antarctic baby making to conceive carry and deliver a baby south of the 60th parallel. It was the Austral summer of love. Fue un misión muy bonita, said a young Juan Pablo Martino. A beautiful mission, he told Chilean TV. Because thanks to that, I am alive. Juan Pablo was one of three children born on the base during the reign of dictator Augusto Pinochet. I mean, pregnancy is what's been written about, but also, I mean, like the Chilean, it's like the those babies that were born. I mean, that was also a lot of geopolitical posturing, too. It was about having, like, the first Antarctican born. It wasn't just a nice thing to do. <laughs> I mean, I guess, you know what I mean? If you need any illustration how rare babies are in Antarctica, Meredith Nash would be the right person to ask. But I'm also actually a senior advisor, inclusion, diversity, and equity with the Australian Antarctic Program. So that's part of my main role now. <laughs> so, yeah, gender in Antarctica is my thing. <laughs> Associate Professor at the University of Tasmania and the Aussie Antarctic Centre, babies are just as much as an oddity for the experts in the area. It's not that they were sort of relaxed about, oh yeah, no, hey, have yeah. a baby. They were encouraging them to have, have babies, which is a very different different thing. I mean... Yeah, I mean, they about territorial claims as well. So, I mean, like, again, so even though the same thing with astronauts, like, women are not supposed to be pregnant once they enter their programme or their training. Colonising Antarctica might sound like an exercise in futility, a seemingly empty continent which is neutral by international agreement. However, the far side of Antarctica is far from neutral. 
Chilean and Argentine media reports on one another's Antarctic missions with suspicion. Over the last few years, Argentina's redrawing of its continental borders reignited questions of sovereignty on the peninsula and the sub-Antarctic. The South Shetland Islands have the largest density of research bases in all of the largely empty Antarctic. There are 16 research stations. Each mission brings a different international character to the ice. It's here you'll find the only Russian Orthodox chapel in Antarctica. Bellinghausen Base has had a Russian Orthodox priest on staff since 2004. The wooden Holy Trinity Chapel overlooking the island gives the impression of permanence. Like it's been there centuries, not decades. Ukraine, Brazil, the United Kingdom, all have brought a little bit of home and a bit of history to the islands. There's a mini United Nations, World Fair sort of vibe. However, it's only the Chileans and Argentinians who dare bring children to the most inhospitable place on Earth. These Antarctic quirks could be easily written off as side notes. However, for most of the programs, having children in Antarctica isn't just odd, it's banned. According to Antarctica New Zealand, nobody on its programs has ever been pregnant. It's part of the medical screenings for New Zealand personnel to check for pregnancy and, should anyone fall pregnant on the ice, to ship them home. The UK, US, Australia and South Africa all have similar rules. So in general, women, you can't be pregnant at the point of, you know, like... You do your medical assessment, you do like a psychological assessment, like in terms of selection, like if you're pregnant, you can't go down south. But I mean, anecdotally, across all the programs, it doesn't mean that women haven't been pregnant down south. It just means that those sorts of things aren't reported. Meredith Nash has worked with the Australian Antarctic program to rethink a woman's place in Antarctica, something that wasn't considered until well after the 80s. On McMurdo Base, the US program conducts additional medical inspections for winter over teams, one to two weeks before station closing, to women of childbearing age. In the 1990s, the South African program went as far as to separate overwintering teams into male and female bases to nix any chances of Antarctic baby making. Anybody who's been south will tell you that there are condoms everywhere. There are field kits, they're available. Like, nobody is under any impression that people don't have sex on station. The fact is, but, but, what people don't talk about, for example, is like, you know, field manuals have never talked about menstruation. Like, they've never made much of a concerted effort to help women expeditioners learn how to manage menstruation out in the field or, like, what that means in Antarctica. They rarely get information about contraceptive or birth control or how to, you know, what to do before you go south. Like, this is all kind of women's secret women's business or even, like, female urinary devices, like how to go to the toilet in the field. None of this has been in the Antarctic field manuals, really. It's in the Australian one this year because I put it there. So I can imagine the, the headlines if, you know, particularly government-funded, you know, programs were to were found to be, you know, paying an extraordinary amount for for shoeies, you know, it's, it's happened for police officers over here beforehand. They don't necessarily think about what, you know, whether they need them or not and what the practical application is, but it's it doesn't tie into the, well, firstly, the, the popular image of Antarctic exploration and Antarctic programs, but not a popular consideration as well by the, by the public. Well, that's right. Or even thinking about, you know, providing, I mean, in the field stores, like down south, you know, there's like a, you know, the sort of like grocery store where you can get like yeah. tampons or whatever, like in a giant program. I mean, I think that if people understood that, yeah, they would think, why are we spending taxpayer dollars on tampons for women expeditioners or whatever, which is crazy considering, again, like the program, most programs provide condoms, you know, like they do to the Olympic Games. Like, this is not weird. Yeah. When we think about where taxpayer money goes in terms of like personal care products, <laughs> still very taboo. Um, how women's bodies are received in Antarctica, like like women are allowed to be there, but I still think there are these strong cultural messages around women can be there, but they can't have different needs or they can't talk about it. And it's, it's still a, yeah, a heroic stuff, but sort of only the strong survive. Like yeah. you know, if you need a female, like a urinary, uh, like a shoe, you know, it's sort of like up to you to sort it out. Yeah, if you want to go to Antarctica, then you kind of just have to be be a man. By the 90s, Argentina and Chile finally banned its personnel from becoming pregnant. The argument being that medical centres were not equipped for prenatal care or complications. Prophylactic appendectomies were one thing, but delivering babies was a job too far for Air Force surgeons. I mean, do you, do you have any records or knowledge of you know, pregnancies on any other uh, programmes, or is this sort of particular period pretty unique in 
Chilean and, and uh, Argentine bases? Well, see, I mean, those, that's what we know about, like, you know, the Chilean and Argentine sort of case studies. I mean, that's something they wanted people to know about. So I think I've never seen any other program talk openly about people being pregnant. I'm sure it's like there's discussion within the Antarctic medical community because obviously there's a lot of knowledge sharing and best practice around, you know, how to how to manage your expeditioners and like mm. yeah, the sort of the health stuff. So surely there, all of that information is out there, but it's not, I, nobody is publishing that. Yeah, I guess that, as you say, that's the difference is that the, um, is though those particular missions were there to, or the, the Argentine and Chilean sort of uh, baby making expeditions were there to publicize the fact that they were having babies out there. Coming at this as a person, like as the, from with my like UTAS, like sociological hat on, not as someone, you know, <laughs> yep. embedded in that AAP. I mean, think about the kind of cultural, like it's to acknowledge like women's reproductive capacities in Antarctica actually challenges like this sort of heroic era of Antarctica is only for men. You know, in order to be in Antarctica, even if you are a woman, you have to be like a man. And so, you know, I think there still is this lingering thing across all the programs, even though women are there and stations are more diverse. The fact is still women are very, very much underrepresented across the program. And so I think it's still a little taboo to talk about reproduction in the context of expeditioners. There's still a thing about if you acknowledge it, then it means that, you know, we can talk about women as women, not as you know, women just having to assimilate in groups of men, which is sort of what it's been historically. Um, if women are asked to suppress, like if they have to suppress menstruation or take birth control or whatever, um, yes, it's within like the medical guidelines for an expedition. But at the same time, it, it kind of takes away the messiness that comes with having women on station, which is why they were, just, they were not allowed there in the first place. There's not much prospect for young people in the South Shetlands. Education doesn't extend beyond primary level after which they have to return to South America. The whole of Esperanza base and Via Las Estrellas would collapse without regular resupplies from the Americas. Another reason that babies are so rare, beyond the inhospitable climate and lack of childcare, is a political one. If you start raising a population of Antarcticans, you'll end up with birth rights and claims that start undermining the status quo on the continent. There's no native population in Antarctica. Hmm. Um, you don't want to create a population of people that are not there for science. So that, I'm, you know, it would be highly threatening, I think, if you, if they position, you know, Antarctic stations as a site for families or, you know, yeah. like accommodating normal life that was not around, making a station work and allowing scientists to collect the data that nobody wants to be seen as contravening the purpose of the, of the treaty and people's relationships. The fantasy it points to is alluring, one that isn't completely unheard of in the Ross Sea and New Zealand side of Antarctica. Year-round cities with self-sustaining populations, true Antarcticans. It sounds like something out of Dr. Strangelove, but the Cold War project was stranger than fantasy. The desire for a model village in the Antarctic is nothing new. Since the 1930s, Admiral Richard E. Byrd had been trying to convince the world of the future importance of the continent. His expeditions established the first U.S. base, a forerunner to McMurdo, that he would call Little America on the Ross Ice Shelf. Byrd rose to fame as the first person to fly over the North Pole in the 1930s. However, he found the South Pole far more compelling. It's a place he would dedicate the rest of his life to exploring. The world swings with an ever-increasing acceleration. Far-flung places, once useless like we thought the North Pole was, and no man's land, become very useful. Uh, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. Talking to CBS in the 1950s, Bird had seen the continent go from a blank space on the map to a place with a semi-permanent US town, Little America. Now, you can understand those people down there being uh, interested because they live down there, the New Zealanders, the Argentinians, the Chileans. As I said, it's the most peaceful place in the world, but I don't think it will be for long. Because of this intense interest on the part of, uh, of other nations and this nation. Bird was a showman. Promoting frozen food and TV appearances were all part of this. Attracting private funding was an important part of being a successful adventurer. Claims of discovering seams of coal, uranium even, were perhaps a law for investment or perhaps a warning from the veteran. We've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole 
in a great uh, ridge of mountains. It's not covered with snow. Enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. Uh, it was once tropical. So uh, we think there's oil there and there's evidence, probably uranium there. Well, as we recklessly expend our resources, the time will come when we can, we'll have to go after that stuff down there. Well, you know, I, I avoided what you said about uranium. I'm not sure about that. I don't want to have the world fighting over the Antarctic. During the wild 1930s, Antarctica was a wild west or south. There were countless expeditions launched to uncover new ground. In doing so, they each set up a potential claim. Countries were getting entrenched in the icy continent, ready to defend their claims. It's a warlike attitude that sits at odds with our current understanding of the peaceful South. Perhaps the biggest illustration of this was the time Nazi Germany invaded Antarctica. The MS Schwabenland was a repurposed postal plane. Not a very promising base for an invasion force, but hear me out. She was a ship carrying 84 men and two catapult-launched seaplanes. The official reason for the mission was to research possible hunting grounds for whales. Whale oil was still an important resource in the 1930s. There was also a survey group with the 1938 German expedition, which was incredibly secretive. Even the crew were given little briefing into the details of the expedition. Expedition photographer Siegfried Sauter was left in the dark. It wasn't until we were sailing when our secret mission was revealed that we would be flying over the Antarctic. But we were exactly in the Antarctic. They wouldn't tell us. The reason for this secrecy would become clearer. The Schwabenland mission was to what was technically a Norwegian claim on the continent. As was the habit of 1930s Germany, they wouldn't let something as trivial as sovereignty get in the way. The seaplanes would spend three weeks flying over Dronning Mildland, mapping the area. Led by Captain Alfred Ritscher, they covered an incredible 600,000 square kilometres. Whiteouts were not only an inconvenience for a photographer trying to document the expedition, they could prove deadly. The blizzards came and everything was white. You couldn't see a thing. The radio operator's antenna stuck out behind to help us find our way. It was a 40 metre long copper cable lined with lead to drag along ice. Because we couldn't see, we had to feel. The dramatic cartography of Dronning Mildland was uncovered by the flights. What would come to be called the Richer Uplands. Giant, tooth-like mountain ridges. However, it's what they left behind which was more telling. A set of harpoons measuring 1.2 metres in length dropped from the plains to mark a boundary, each decorated with metal flags bearing the Nazi swastika. One of Sauter's most haunting photos from the expedition was that the Nazi flag unfurled over the Fimble ice shelf. It was a land grab. Placing the perimeter markers for an Antarctic claim, Nazi Germany had plans for a more permanent presence on the continent. Thankfully, they never did return. War broke out in 1939, which sunk plans for a second expedition. All they left with were 600 aerial photographs from the survey and a handful of emperor penguins. Rumour has it, one ended up in the private zoo of Hermann Goering. But those 20 or so Nazi flags are still buried fast in the pack ice. A reminder of the more brazen ambitions in the south that were only frozen by the Antarctic Treaty. The babies of Antarctica might belong to the same category. They're just as much part of the odd southern land grab. Unlike the harpoons, their arrival in the continent was just the beginning of their stories. There are at least 11 of them alive today. Some have chosen to turn their back on this novel place of birth. Others have leaned into their identity as the first Antarcticans. Should they ever need an introduction, it's a hell of an icebreaker. But where are these children now? I asked Horatio if he had any links back to Antarctica's first family. No, well, I don't. I, mean, I, only, I only had a uh, look. The, the names that come to my mind are the father. Yes. It looks like Cap Captain Doctor, I don't know. I mean, the mother that you, you have there. Um, that, that, that's it. I mean, even from the personal point of view, except for, the, for this kind of a stunned novelty, 
who were there to visit the, the newborn. They were other children because I mean, the Esperanza was the first the base there where, where families were put, which in my opinion was kind of stupid because it's a small base. And, and frankly, I, let's put it this way, uh, in, in this brutal way, I had on those days and, and, and later on other fish to fry. Armed with just the family name and a few meager details, I set off to try and track down our Antarctican baby. Now there are a lot of e-palmers in the Argentine phone book. Crossing social media profiles and crossing continents, I eventually singled in on one, which was too much of a coincidence not to try. Now 43 and living in Barcelona, Emilio is unrecognizable from the baby in Horacio's photos. An extroverted CrossFit fanatic with a full sleeve of tattoos, it's almost as if he tried to get as far away from Argentina and Antarctica as possible. Finding him was, I assume, purposefully difficult. Not much to show for family connections, no reflections on Antarctica, no interviews with the press. He spends a lot of time in the gym and has a large Polynesian style tattoo on his left shoulder. So I ask him, and if there was a New Zealand connection to his Tamoko? To my surprise, he replies, saying, I've never been to New Zealand, but thank you for the tattoos. I don't usually answer, but yes, I'm the first person in the world to be born there. Quite a claim. Now, I wasn't born yesterday, so I asked the one person who would know for certain, his mother. Silvia Morella de Palma was the first person to give birth in Antarctica and in her own right, an historic figure on the continent. I enlisted the help of Damien Benuto, a Herald colleague with family ties to Argentina, to cold call the Buenos Aires number with potential links to Antarctica. Just about to dial in at the moment. So again, it is a chance that it is complete goose chase. Just try and Skype her now. So it's about eight o'clock in Buenos Aires. But we do get an answer. Not from Silvia, but from younger brother, Juan Lucho. His parents are now quite elderly and not interested in talking. Lucho, however, is intrigued. He's quite happy to talk about his brother, who he informs us is a special case. Hola, um... Buenas tardes o buenas noches. Sí, Emilio nació en la Antártida, el primer ser humano nació en el cajete polar antártico. Realmente Juan sounded like quite a character. He was remarkably relaxed, and in a series of voice notes, he recounted his family's surprising connection to Antarctica. My father is a lieutenant colonel. At the time, I think he was a lieutenant, but he was someone with a great military career. They weren't there with the Antarctic Institute. They were there with the military. While he answered most of our questions, he apologised for what were childhood memories from a time long ago. I know that he is a computer engineer. The faculty for the military gave him a scholarship to study because he had been born in Antarctica. He studied and he went to live there and never came back. When we were kids, what I do remember I can tell you, I went to the same school as my brother and everyone I came across would tell me they know who my brother is, they know who my family is, I know who you are. Life is different when you're a kid and you have a hyper-famous brother. It must have been a great story growing up to tell people in the playground or later in life. I caught up with Damien, who explained bringing your family to remote places isn't that odd for an Argentinian. Yeah, when you came to me at the story and you mentioned that it was quite unique to Argentina to have them, but it didn't surprise me all that much because family is so central to, to everything in Argentina. Sometimes you'll have like various generations of the same family living together. You have to do what you can to keep the family unit together. And even if that means moving to Antarctica altogether, you, you, you try and do it, right? It had been eyed with a huge amount of suspicion from the rest of the uh, international Antarctic programs as, you know, a bit of a, of a reinforcement of a claim. And everybody was wondering, what are you, what are you up to? in trying to set up your model villages out there. I'm wondering, is it uh, something lost in translation of the, the South American culture? It's difficult to view anything like this without the context of the Maldinas or the, the Falkland Islands, because, I mean, the Argentinians are very sensitive about land that they view as their own. I mean, if there is a sensitivity or a caution or a fear in the Argentinians, it would be understandable, given that they're still, to this day, they're, they're still 
massive discussions in Argentina about the the ownership of the the Malvinas and whether whether it really does belong to the UK or whether it should be part of Argentina. And yeah. I can understand that, like just having having lived in Argentina and had had discussions with people about the Malvinas, maybe a, a little sense of fear or insecurity that somebody might be looking to encroach on their space that they've claimed on Antarctica. The babies of Antarctica have always been seen as a bizarre stunt, a claim for part of the continental landmass. But is it possible there was something lost in translation? As the rest of the world eyes the schools in Antarctica and model towns with suspicion, I can imagine there would be uproar around the new 350 million Scott base if Antarctica New Zealand were to include a kindergarten in their designs, not least from New Zealand ratepayers. But from the other side of the ice, do we appear cool and uncaring when shipping out fathers and mothers? separating families for 15 months at a time. For winter expeditioners, they sort of go into that experience knowing that, you know, if something happens, a crisis, like if you break your leg in Antarctica in winter, you will be there for the duration of your time. So particularly around pregnancy, like I think that stuff will never change, even though surely it has happened in the past that somebody has fallen pregnant in the course of a season, they've been flown out in time or whatever. Yeah, I don't think that the criteria will never be changed simply because it's so risky. That's uh, still something which probably isn't isn't going to change anytime soon and while there is still an Antarctic treaty I can't see another period where they're going to be encouraging people to have have babies. No, definitely not. And too, I mean, well, I mean, the d- parallels between space and Antarctica, I mean, are not that strange. Considering, I mean, Antarctica is like the primary terrestrial analog for space. So, I mean, all the sort of human performance research, like for example, all the stuff happening around Mars, like all that research, like a lot of it comes from Antarctica, because it is sort of the most remote place where you can replicate conditions. Um, people living in isolation for long periods and extreme weather and all that sort of stuff. And I mean, I suppose, I mean, part of the problem too is that you know. Think about like Sally Ride and NASA in 1983. I mean, mm. you have groups of all male engineers who have literally, you know, Sally Ride is the first woman to go up into space with that program. It's like there's a big unknown and it's more difficult. So, like, for example, like Sally Ride's periods were a big deal. Like, these male engineers were like, well, what do we do about her? And so, you know, they actually didn't know what would happen. Like, what happens when women menstruate in space? Like, that had never, that's a question that had never been covered. Like, they actually thought that, like, blood would, like, travel back up into the body like they were really confused she's going up for like five days or something like that or a week and like they asked her she needed like would 100 tampons be enough it's like this amazing example of like just the sheer lack of knowledge women's place in these extreme environments and um like so sally Ride is like a pioneer but the problem is that whatever 40 years later it's sort of like we're still dealing with the same questions i mean yeah. there for example there there's almost no research about women's reproductive biology in antarctica there's almost nothing. Yeah. There's tons of information about sleep. There's lots of human, like, biomedical research on Antarctic expeditioners, but there's nothing. There's basically nothing about women's bodies. Um, and I think that that goes to show, again, that it's like a lack of institutional will to know more, because if you know more, then you have to accommodate people more. What we don't know, we can't deal with. Antarctica was set aside by science, partially to answer the questions about the nature of our planet but also to answer questions about the frontiers of exploration. But there are many questions that are yet to be answered about a woman's place in Antarctica, let alone a family. Rather than safety, squeamishness or cultural reluctance, there's perhaps a political reason why no more babies have been born there. The treaty system means that any attempts at a naturalized population in Antarctica could be seen as extremely destabilizing. This is why the babies of Antarctica are such an oddity. They date back to a time when a couple of rogue southern nations sought to shore up their claims over the sub-Antarctic, posturing and polar publicity stunts from unstable dictatorships. Yet, the Niños Antarcticos also come from a culture where family and work are closer, often inseparable. It's an Antarctic taboo, but questions of raising families in extreme places will likely return, if not in Antarctica, then beyond. What happens if one day we get to Mars and we haven't even asked these questions, let alone answered them? Emilio might have been the first person born in Antarctica, but it's unlikely we've seen the last. You have been listening to Detour Antarctica. This podcast has been written and voiced by me, Thomas Bywater. Each episode has been mixed and engineered by Tash Chittick, with special thanks to Ethan Sills, Francis Cook, Steph Holmes, Andrew Laxon, David Rowe and Nadia Tolich. 
This series wouldn't have been possible without the translation of Damien Venuto, an input from the experts and scientists that call Antarctica home. Horacio Villalobos, Meredith Nash, Juan Lucio, and Emilio Palma. For imagery, details, and Herald premium content on the Antarctic stories we covered, and to find more podcasts like this one, go to nzherald.co.nz or listen on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts.